thanks everybody for coming over here to this side. We're gonna spend uh, probably most of the rest of the day out here just kind of working on details about management. So, these are some demonstration plots that we planted throughout the summer, right? And so, interestingly, most of everything has already come out, with the exception of our corn stand down there and a few sorghum stalks that we left standing. So what I'd, I'd like to go over while we're out here is just like some really basic management stuff just to make sure everybody feels good about maybe being able to go home and do this. And so we're going to talk about like establishing our crops, how to manage weeds in them, a little bit about soil fertility and like what the, the crops actually demand. Um, we'll look at our crops and then talk a little bit about cropping sequence and crop rotation. So, and then we're going to deal with some harvesting equipment, harvest and storage, and um, kind of dig into each of those pieces individually. So, um, when I'm thinking about starting, starting out on something like this, I'm thinking about how am I going to get my crop in the ground, right? And so, if as the small scale producer who probably, does anybody have a tractor here? Awesome. Okay. Does anybody have a drill? Drill. Yeah, okay, so let's say you have a tractor, but you don't have a drill. What are you going to do? Are you going to contract it in? Are you going to broadcast the seed? Um, or find some, you know, are you going to disc it in? Something like that. And so um, the most important thing I've come up with, or I've come across, is getting the seed in the ground, but not too deep. And so you can be successful by broadcasting seed, no doubt, and probably many of you have. But um, after after many, many failures, I accepted that you're just totally up to the whims of the weather, right, if you, if you broadcast. And um, getting it into the ground is the surefire way to get it out of the ground, right, get it up and out. And so this is a good opportunity to talk a little bit about that. And if actually we could all kind of like circle around to the side here, we can point out some different plots to illustrate those differences. And so what, what we have here carved out are maybe uh, eight to ten plots and they're kind of on an angle so the flags are a little bit hard to understand where the plots are but um, the plots are about eight feet wide and like 35 feet long and in each of the plots there's a crop with right next to it being like an alternative established method method um, just as a comparison and so where these guys are standing right here is winter rye planted like way too early but just here as a demonstration Right here is winter pea. This is that yellow pea that we were looking at earlier. This is planted too early as well, but here for demonstration. And then right here is buckwheat. This is a good time to plant buckwheat. So this was planted almost two weeks ago on August 7th. These were all planted August 7th. And this is like a really nice time to get it. And none of this was actually drilled or seeded. Um, and so what, what we actually had is spring crops come out and all like that residual weeds in there, right? So that grew up in the, in the winter crop. And we were getting a lot of rain, like every day it seemed like almost a half inch. And so that's the, like the perfect opportunity to be able to broadcast instead of direct seed. I will mention that earlier in the season, I planted peas right here in the same place in a dry spell and like maybe five or six came up. This whole like thousands of seeds. Just because, I mean, what they actually did is they germinated and then dried out and it was, they were done. So this is an example of how it can work. Earlier, if you could have seen it, it was a, I mean, a weedy mess, it was a, it was a wreck. So um, now for each of these, if you'll notice, there's like two flags per. So on the uphill side, this is one kind of plot, and on the downhill side, this is one kind of plot. If you were to come around, you might be able to see visually the distinction between them. But long story short, on the downhill side of each crop, what we did is we mowed it down really good with a flail mower, threw out the seed, and then ran a power harrow through there. So it kind of incorporated the, the crop, I mean the seed a little bit, but just like surface. And then on the uphill side, all we did is throw it out and then mow it down really good. And when I look at these visually, they look essentially the same, suggesting to me that in the right conditions, you can establish a crop without disturbing your soil, which is like a great thing to do if you have the opportunity. You can really only do that at the end of the season without having your weeds jump up on you. So 
Um, something to keep in mind for timing. Now, yeah, question. When you say power here, are you talking about a Harley rig? Type? Mm, I don't know Harley Harley rig, but it uh, it's just these tines that spin on this axis okay. around and around and around, and they're like six inches long. Okay. But I only scratched the top inch. Okay. Yep. Um, and if you were to work your way down, I think you might be able to see a difference in the peas, but not the rye. The peas look like tilling them in did a tiny bit better. I don't think this would actualize into like a yield difference. It's too similar. And then the buckwheat looks essentially the same. I mean, it looks the same between the two plots. Question mark. Yeah. Are these, is this the weeds that you said was really bad? No, the that's that's cover crop that crop. Pat had put in there just for kicks. Okay. Yep. Um, the weeds that were really bad are, you can still kind of see them down there in the beans. We'll get to the beans in just a minute. Um, so. If this, if this is a, a discussion of broadcast versus drill, this is a really good example, like an exceptional example of establishing a cover crop or any crop successfully by broadcasting. Um, and perhaps, you know, if you, if you know that you got some wet weather coming, you might be able to do it. So when we're thinking about the small landholder trying to get some crop in the ground, and I'm really happy to hear many of you have tractors, um, there are if you don't want to buy a drill, there are some low technology solutions available. So for example, if you were running in some tilled ground, if, if you were disking up your ground or rototilling it or however you're going to work it up, you could run your earthway seeder through there and you could get decent establishment. Or you could gang them up and, you know, so you don't have to go through a thousand times because that's a dense stand. Um, you could gang them up and maybe cover a foot or two at a time, which would be great. And then it would be a lot like a little drill. Um, there are, so that's like working in tilled ground where an earthway works well, but like if you're trying to go the no-till route, you're a little bit limited on seeding availability without actually buying a drill. So um, we actually have an example of a, a single unit no-till quote-unquote drill, although it's just a planter, one unit, um, that goes on a walk-behind tractor that somebody in Tennessee made for us um, just to show that it can be done, sort of like a proof of concept. And it's done with all like hardware parts, I mean hardware store parts, so that anybody should be able to go out and do it. I don't know the value of that product, like probably a lot less than a thousand bucks to build. It assumes you have a way to actually drag it, which would be a walk behind a tractor. I don't know if you could drag it without one. Um, and unfortunately what we don't have here, but we have somewhere else on the farm, is a no-till push seeder. So if you were, let's just say, rolling down some rye and planting beans into it, or whatever your crops are. You might be, be able to be successful at it by using this no-till push seeder and the, the only difference between them other than like how the seeder part actually works is that it's a lot heavier. And so it's got a, a nice double disc opener that's going to cut a slit then you know you follow it with your planting equipment what's actually dropping the seed in and it works just the same but it's just a heavy piece of equipment. It takes a lot of oomph to, to move but um, it works really well. And I should point out that that cedar was used, while this ground was tilled ground, we used that cedar to plant all the warm season crops. So the beans, which are basically ready to harvest and laying on the ground, sorghum, which got pulled out already, and then the corn crop, all planted with that little cedar. Very, I mean, really successful crop establishment, which I think is like the first thing we ought to be thinking about here. And um, as farmers, I'm sure everybody's thinking about that too. So let's talk a little bit about planting dates. So is, is there anybody familiar, everybody familiar with planting dates for grains? I mean, more or less. I mean, it's a warm season stuff. We're talking about the, the last frost date, you know, like are we before or after that? Corn is a little bit frost, uh, frost tolerant, so you can actually plant that a couple weeks before. But uh, in organic management, if you're thinking about like, let's say rolling down a cover crop or incorporating cover crop, that's gonna be delayed, of course. But with regard to planting date of conventional corn, you can get in kind of early. With other warm season cereals like sorghum, you're going to be planting after the last frost date. It's more, more um, frost sensitive, but like heat loving. Sorghum can like kill it in a high tunnel, you know, despite it being really, really hot. Um, for small grains, which are planted in the fall, let's just say that we're not going to try to even bother with them in the spring because I don't think that they would yield very well. Although we did pull an oat crop off of here with some success spring oats. Um, let's just assume that you should, you should go with a fall planting. 
then we're talking about like for this region, um, end of September, early, very early October kind of thing is ideal. And like with many crops, the later you get, especially cool season crops, the later you get on that planting date, the more you should up your seeding rate just because it has a harder time establishing and it doesn't actually have a chance to tiller, if you remember tillering from our talk earlier. So fewer shoots are present if you plant it later, so up your seeding rate. Um, uh, opposite from the sp uh, spring, you kind of look at the last frost date and go backwards, something before. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I haven't used, um, I'll confess, I, I haven't used the last frost date as a reference point for myself. I just am going on my experience of what somebody else told me and worked well. Um, so like NC State though has a, a document that has a map of North Carolina with planting dates for wheat and then adjustments on that for where you where uh, for different crops you know if you're talking barley or oats or something I would hope UGA would have something similar um, and so that's I mean that's the the very basics for cool season legumes if you recall those are like more uh, t they're less tolerant of cold winters and they need to be planted earlier and so I would target the first two weeks of September for planting you know I mean even cover crops you know so hairy vetch, pea, lentil, whatever, whatever it is you're planting. Early September would be ideal in this climate. Um, Later is better if you're down the mountain. Um, and buckwheat, like we talked about in the, in the classroom earlier, doesn't really like it cold, doesn't really like it hot. It's kind of like this, it's like a little Goldilocks sort of a plant that you can plant early August and get a good crop. I think in cooler climates you can plant earlier um, and then warmer climates plant later, so maybe middle in August. I mean, maybe where you are, it's September, um, that kind of thing. <clears throat> um, any questions about planting dates? Super basic stuff, but just to go over the dates themselves. Um, okay, why, why don't we kind of like keep walking and just get a look at some of this stuff. If you're using some equipment to get your seed in the ground, it's really good to calibrate it. And so with the, the no-till push seeder that we were using, we obviously fussed around with it for a little while, and then we're able to achieve what we wanted with these crops. I broadcast this by hand, and I'll tell you up front, they're like way, way overseeded. I in part did that on purpose because I had such bad luck last time, um, but also wasn't really thinking about it at the time and wished I had afterward. I think that having a population this dense is not going to be a very productive population. Um, it's the the peas and the cereals are probably a little more flexible, um, but this this is way too dense. Just for the record, um, so if we were to talk about like so plants plants per acre is one way to think of it, but I think it's more useful to talk about like plants per square foot so that you can actually go out there and look at it and gauge whether you've put down too many or not enough. And you would do that while you're actually putting out the seed, of course, right? Um, so, for example, buckwheat, 200,000 plants per acre is like maybe your target, which is actually just five plants per square foot. And I think there's more than that there. Um, and if we go up the hill a little bit, the peas are only supposed to be three per square foot, also seeded pretty densely. And three is a rough estimate that when you scale it up to an acre, probably is a little bit off. You know, I think the, the number is more like 2.7 something. It doesn't really matter, but let's say two to three seeds per square foot um, or 130,000 plants to the acre. Um, at the top of the hill where the, the cereal rye is, pretty much all winter cereals like that, all these small grains are about one and a half million plants to the acre, which translates to, um, where's that number? About 35 plants per square foot. So that, actually it's a really big difference between the the broad leaf there and the cereal. Um, and so I don't think we're too far off from for 35 per square foot on the cereal rye. Um, and you would increase, so if you plant it early, you might go a little bit lower than that, and if you plant it late, keep going up. So some of the latest stuff that I've planted, I shot for like over two million, just to, to be sure. Um, and you could do the math on that to figure out what that works to. So. These are broadcast seeded, um, and if these down here, 
which are our summer crops. These are these are kind of like our winter crops, cool season. Our summer crops are much um, planted much less densely, and so beans, which we see here, um, planted at about a hundred thousand per acre, or well, these are planted in rows, I should say. So let me back up for a second. The uphill side of this was planted on 24 inch rows and the downhill side was planted on 12. I didn't really notice a difference between the two. These crops got eaten on pretty good by Japanese beetles and when they, for whatever reason, dry beans respond to stress and they just kind of like jumpstart their reproduction. And so they set seed and matured pretty quickly. And so the, you can see the weeds are just kind of having, having fun right now as the crop dries down. So when we were out here working, I, I wouldn't say there was much of a, a, a noticeable difference in like weed pressure with different, pop, with different uh, row widths. I was expecting that you might see, you know, fewer weeds in the 12 inch rows, but qualitatively I didn't. Um, but anyway, if, if we wanna go ahead and calculate out how many seeds you need to have per foot of row or per 10 feet of row, in a crop obviously depends on your row spacing. So in bean, for example, the 24 inch ones up here, these guys are five seeds per foot. Um, and so you could calibrate that on your planter or if you're putting this out by hand, you can just figure out the math. Um, cut that number exactly in half for the 12 inch row spacing, right? So two and a half seeds per foot or 25 seeds per 10 feet, however you wanna think about that. Um, so beans are, are, have a relatively high planting rate compared to, say, corn, for example. But it's approximately equal to sorghum. So the sorghum crop here, which has been mostly pulled out, 100,000 plants to the acre, but I was shooting for 8-inch rows. Um, and so on an 8-inch row, that's like 1.5 or, let's say, 15, inch, 15 seeds per 10 feet. Um, so it's, it's actually a pretty loose population. Sorghum 100,000K, we achieved less than that. Um, we tried to get different row spacings, but the, uh, it, that was not very easily achieved. So what we have is just one basic plot. Um, and you know, I think I, I should explain a little bit more about what we're seeing out here. Um, I wish Pat Battle was here, the, the head man here, who could explain a little bit more about the history of this field. But this field used to be plowed up and down like this, and I think it gullied out right down the middle of this plot right here. And we lost a lot of soil nutrients uh, and topsoil, I believe, out of the middle. And so you can see the dip in the corn plants right there, right in the middle. Same thing was here for the sorghum and all, all the way up the entire plot. Um, this happens to be a particularly like low fertility soil and pretty weedy too. Um, so actually the the sorghum crop, which again, this is this dual purpose variety, can be used for pressing into molasses, or you can get a little bit of grain out of it. It's not a very high yielding one. Um, but sorghum usually has a, a more robust stalk than that. But in this sort of low nutrient environment, the stalks were spindly and started to lay down. So a wind came through one night and laid more than half of them down when they were half ripe. So we went ahead and pulled them all out. And since then, they've continued to fall. Um, so this is that first half right there, which has been dried out, not out here in the field, but uh, in some dry storage, and we can mess around with threshing that out a little bit later. Corn's population is the lowest among all of these, so corn is usually planted in the 25 to 30,000 per acre, or if, let's say, you're, you're going to do 24-inch rows at 25,000 plants to the acre, that's 12 seeds per 10 feet. So just a little more than one seed per foot, right? Um, this crop was is nitrogen challenge, as you can tell. We we continued to put out some some form of nitrogen fertilizer, and it, it didn't really improve a whole lot as the um, as the season went on. So it's been it's been a tough year out in this field. Probably the toughest field I've ever had to work with. But what we have here on the left half of this is one variety. This is the green corn variety that we were looking at earlier, um, which has these really attractive green cobs. And then over there on the right side is a gourd seed one that's really great for making corn type flowers. Um, and we wanted to experiment with just see how the different ones grow and develop. And this one flowered a lot earlier than the other one, which is great because these crops, right, 
corn crosses really well, really easily. So I, I believe that we missed the, uh, the pollination time. I'm just going to throw that on the ground. Um, I think that's trash. Okay. Um, yeah, so basic, basic agronomics are going to be, if we, if we take it back to the agronomic piece, we're talking 30,000 to the acre at most. When you start to deal with heirloom varieties, like mod modern varieties are really well adapted to take high populations like 30 plus thousand. But heirloom varieties tend to not do as well in those situations and don't respond as well either to nutrient inputs. And so um, 25,000 might be a little bit high for um, an heirloom and maybe 20,000 is more appropriate. But depending on what you're going for, if you're growing for feed, I would recommend going with a modern variety, which has like really a really great package of disease resistance, resistance to certain insects and things like that. They're just really well bred and like can double your yields compared to an heirloom. Heirlooms are, at least in the grain world, um, just really underperform. You know, really variable productivity and just maybe a quarter to 75% of the yields, you know, depending on the year. Um, so do be cautious about choosing to grow heirloom or heritage types when you get out there. Okay, any questions so far? So that's, that's a covering our crops, establishment, and so forth. Um, and we can dig into the next set of management. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Yeah. Have you done any, like, really wide spacing with, like, older varieties of wheat? Um, of wheat? Yeah. Or other small grains with... Um, Taking into account like the root systems and maybe getting more tillers like in the tillering in the fall and in the spring. I can't say that I have. Um, I've only really worked with modern varieties except for a little bit of spelt, and we just planted it at a, the recommended seeding rate, which is, you know, in the millions or above a million. Um, I mean, I, I know that out in out west, row spacing is a lot wider. Um, with like eight inches being the narrowest you'd see, but sometimes people plant it on a 24, yeah. you know, 12 to 24. Okay, so with regard to soil fertility, as you can see out here, it can be challenging sometimes, especially for cereals. Um, I think the, the bean crop that we got is, is pretty average, um, and I'm happy to report that because it has a relatively low nutrient requirement. But our cereals, which are, you know, super high nutrient requiring, had a hard time out here in this field, despite us adding like a good bit over the season. Um, and I consider it this more of a lesson learned on soil management than actual nutrient management. Um, but let's talk about just really quickly about nutrients required per crop. Just really coarsely NPK required per crop. Like we talked about earlier, corn's going to be the big hog. It's going to require less potassium than the cereal, I mean the cool season cereals. Uh, sorghum's kind of in the middle. Cool season cereals don't require nearly as much nitrogen. Um, so like 60 pounds for wheat, 130 pounds for corn, we went over this earlier, um, and then approximately 50 to 60 pounds of phosphorus and potassium for both of those, except the cool season cereals which require over 100 pounds, which is a lot. It's a heck of a lot, I would say. Um, legumes, generally you're not going to have to apply as much nitrogen, but it is standard practice for in the dry bean growing world to add a little bit of nitrogen early on because apparently they do not start to fix nitrogen until middle of the season and so it's like a little bit to get them going. Soybeans, people don't add nitrogen. I think they've just been really well bred to not require it. But these other crops uh, that have received less breeding attention, I mean these other legumes, they, they're more needy. So expect to have to add something early in the season to get it off the ground. Um, what kind of fertility source, I wanna, I'd like to get a quick survey of what kind of fertility sources y'all use or what you'd like to use and how you're thinking about using it. Anybody using manures here, chicken litter, dairy, anything? Yeah, lots of that. Anybody using uh, compost, leaf mulch, anything like that? Yeah? How's that working out for you? 
Still too soon to say. <laughs> Still too soon to say, yeah. We've actually had to bury, we're in sand, so we actually take old rotted trees and trench them into the ground. It's that bad there. Sure, sure, sure. Had some good luck with that. Good. What about uh, fancier types? Uh, fish emulsion, feather meal, anything like that? Soybean meal? Anybody use those? I did a little bit with the uh, distiller's grain, the spent uh, barley from the uh, brewery. Yeah. And this seemed to work pretty well. It was mixed. It wasn't a real controlled trial or anything, but I was just putting it out in the uh, garden area, spreading it out. And where I placed it, uh, especially where I placed it fairly thickly, the soil the next spring was great soil. I mean, just loose and rich. I mean, this is coming from hard clay. Um, it seemed to be very fertile, but if I got too much, it seemed to have a very, very suppressive effect. And there's a possibility it had some Roundup in it that had been, you know, they used Roundup to kill it uh, at harvest time. So I'm not sure if that was part of the deal with that. But as far as fertility goes, it put a lot of nitrogen in the soil, right. given enough time for it to break down in the soil. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's kind of a concentrated protein, right? All the carbs are gone. Um, okay, well, that's good. I mean, so when thinking about growing this stuff for grains on the small scale, I think you can have nicer type you know, fish emulsions or whatever kind of meals work for you. But as soon as you start to scale up, you know, you need to be thinking about how to get larger quantities of less dense stuff out there, chicken litter being like maybe one of the better ones. Because I mean, the tonnage that it requires to do an acre is a heck of a lot. So um, if you have a tractor and a spinner spreader, maybe that's the way to go, small scale, if you're not gonna hire in a manure spreader or something like that. Um, so just something to think about. I mean, preceding these cereals with the high nitrogen demand, like we talked about with a legume, is always a great idea from a crop rotation and nutrient management perspective. That'll get you a leg up, but for something like corn, maybe you're not gonna be able to achieve what you need and you're gonna have to be thinking about supplementing it. And then, in my opinion, continually replacing phosphorus and potassium that you're pulling out and other micronutrients, of course. So something to keep in mind and if Anybody has any particular questions about the nutrient management piece for grains? Um, we can dig into that, but it's not like it's particularly different for, for other crops. Um, from a pest management perspective, when I, th when I think about pest of grain crops, I'm always just thinking about weeds more so than, than insects or diseases. Um, I work, when I worked in the organic no-till piece, which is cover crop based, we never had any insect problems and we never had any disease problems. And I'm not sure the reason for that. Um, there's reason to suspect anyway that the uh, beneficial insects that basically live in the cover crop mulch that you're providing them do you a good service of keeping your bad insects away. There's reason to believe that uh, based on the little bit of research that was done on it. Can't really say a whole lot about it except that I haven't, I haven't run into any trouble until I started working in the tilled ground um, with, without a thick cover crop mulch and things went, you know, things could be so-so, things could, be, could go south or be on track depending on whether you took any measures to control it. So for example, in beans this year we had a lot of Mexican bean beetle trouble, um, but our, our grain crops have not had any trouble with insects. I'd say insects are far less of a problem in, in uh, corn and soybean than you know, the defoliating type insects that you get in bean crops or legumes. Um, so that's a, you know, another consideration when thinking about which crops to grow. Um, management techniques, you can apply a pesticide, but you're, you know, you're, you're pretty limited on what you can do once they're there. Um, but from a weed management perspective, which again is what I tend to be thinking about when I'm thinking about problems that I'm gonna get, um, I would never, so this, this year we just kind of had to march into this field and throw a bunch of crops in and it's a really weedy field. Uh, I would never do that if it were my farm. You know, I would, I would step back maybe two or three years and try to get the weed seed bank down, um, put a really strong emphasis on weed management because, as I'm sure you know, um, you don't get a lot of return per acre on those hours you invest in weeding probably hand weeding or maybe you're dragging a cultivator through there um, compared to say a vegetable crop where you get you know a handsome price for that. Price point on grains is relatively low so you want to minimize the amount of time you spend weeding right. Um, so for beans and other legumes the rolled rye system actually works really well. 
if you want to try to go the no-till route, eliminate some tillage, eliminate some work, and suppress weeds. I mean, it, it does a really good job if you don't have an existing, an already existing big weed population. If you do, start over um, and resort to tillage. I mean, tillage is awesome, right, because it can knock back your weeds so effectively. Um, but if you want to try to make things a little bit, streamline your system, make things a little bit quicker, maybe think about doing a rolled rye followed by a legume. Works really well. Um, rolling hairy vetch or crimson clover, then following it with a cereal, hit or miss. Uh, really poor nitrogen supply to the corn crop, um, or I would say inadequate, maybe not poor, but um, just something to think about. But these, those methods can do a, a really good job of suppressing weeds, but I think, especially for cereals, should be mixed in with a good tillage rotation or regimen keep those weeds back. Um, it's just not worth your time, I don't think, to be weeding in there. Question? Yeah, Dunt had really good success with frost seeding clover and wheat. Um, preferred that method over harvesting it and then planting hairy vetch, you know, which was like the alternative. Because, I mean, it's like huge biomass uh, by August. So, I mean, it, it does really good. Yeah, I, w I would definitely recommend that if you have the opportunity. So, you were throwing it in before. You were throwing it in. March. Okay. Yeah, this was in Pennsylvania, so maybe back it up a little bit for down here. Um, beginning of March. Um, and, you know, you can very successfully, depending on your harvest method, do that in summer cereals, you know, something that's got a 24 inch. Uh, plant spacing or row spacing without a huge canopy. So like in beans that are canopied over, it's not very successful until they start to dry down. But if you can get, you know, some, something that's taller in a shade like red clover in there uh, in the, you know, in June or July, I mean, you can have a really nice crop at the end of the season. Um, of course you trample it when you go through there and harvest, depending on how you're harvesting, you might like trample all of it or just a few rows. Um, but just something to consider for interseeding. Um, and based on some research that we were doing up at Penn State, there's, I mean, you can get a really nice cover crop established, high biomass in the, going into fall and not affect your corn yield, um, even regardless of whether it's a legume. So, um, something to think about for relay cropping, you know, I think that there's good potential to get a, your next grain crop in or cover crop into a corn or a sorghum stand. Um, yeah, any more questions about that? Um, okay, so maybe just to, just to wrap up on weeds, um, my emphasis has always been on managing per annual weeds and I've only ever really had trouble with summer annuals, so the guys that are growing up in my beans and corn, I've never had trouble with winter annuals and wheat. I think a lot of people do. I think the further south you go, the more problematic it is because the winters are milder. Um, but if, if that is a problem, um, try to, you know, the best strategy I think is to just try to alternate warm season, cool season, warm season, cool season for your crops so that you're actually eliminating your weed seed bank. I mean, that stuff can replenish so quickly um, just by having a few plants set seed that you have to, I mean, in my opinion, just stay on top of your weeds, um, which is where tillage comes in and can be really effective or anything where you can mow. You know, I mean, maybe, maybe if you were growing cattle and you wanted to take silage so that you can cut down your weeds before they set seed. That might be a good alternative management. Um, something like that. And you can make silage out of more than just corn. So, um, If you're dealing with perennial weeds, um, tillage is the way to go. Don't try to go no-till on that one unless you're willing to take your field out of production and just cover crop it. That's the only like no-till perennial weed management strategy. Just cover crop, cover crop, cover crop. Um, or put it into hay and mow the hay, have a competitive hay, but you gotta till it to establish it. So um, tillage is by, by and large the most effective from a time perspective. Um, any questions about that? Weeds. Okay. Um, diseases are pretty, pretty minor on cereals, knock on wood. Um, at least in my experience, I mean, Diseases can devastate legume crops really, really easily. And I don't know what the difference is between them, but like this sorghum crop, 
um, has a striping disease, but I think the effect on it's, I mean, super negligible compared to if you get some sort of stem or foliar blight on, uh, on the beans. And like I mentioned earlier, they really don't like having wet feet and you can get root rots really easily on legumes. So um, if you're growing in wet ground, definitely be cautious about that. Um, I mean, you, you can lose a crop for sure of beans, but you're, you're far less likely to lose a crop to a, a disease in a summer cereal. Um, maybe winter cereals have a few that are of concern, like the ones that make vomitoxins. You know, you want to be sure to avoid those, those fusarium wilts. Um, and if you are going to be eating it and you see signs of mold on there, it might be worth sending it away to get tested because um, it can be dangerous. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to get too sick. Um, but in my experience, having worked in the, the no-till high cover crop piece, we didn't see, I mean, and that's like super diverse, right? Super diverse crops going in and probably pretty diverse soil microbes, you know, that kind of thing. We didn't see any disease crop up. And there's good reason to believe that by diversifying your crops, you can resist diseases a little bit better. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's the long and the short of the field management stuff, um, the, like kind of just the basics. So in my opinion, the next, the next more, and probably more important question, if that's like management stuff, the things that you learn as you go, then let's talk a little bit about what to do with the crop. So corn crop isn't yet ready to harvest, but it will be soon. Some of those green cobs are. The white gourd seed variety is like far off. Um, and as I'm sure all of you know, there are a bunch of different ways that you can harvest this stuff and get it into the barn or wherever. Um, so if you have a walk behind tractor, you can get a sickle bar attachment, which is really sweet. You can use that for all of these crops, cutting them down and then picking them up is so much easier. Um, there's, so there's a lot of old technology for harvesting corn, you know, there's like a, a hand and knife that you wear kind of like a glove and you can just slice and go, slice and go. Um, the scythe is really good for small grains and for beans and things like that. The scythe is not great for these like large stocked um, kind of like spread out like sorghum and corn, um, but you might be able to be pretty successful. Um, I, the majority of the work that I've done has been with walk behind tractors and then just cutting it out by hand. Um, I would be careful to avoid pulling. So like if, if you don't have any of these tools, get some snippers or something like that, or get a corn knife, which is one of those that's got a curved blade and you can just slice and go. Um, pulling out roots, of course, you're disturbing the soil and pulling out all that, like the really nice rhizospheric stuff, but then that soil goes into your threshing area. Um, and you know, there's rocks and there's soil bits that are basically the same size as these grains and that's how you end up with dirty grain. Um, so you just wanna be very careful to not do that I was harvesting some of these beans earlier today, which should have been harvested, let's say, a week or two ago. Um, and in just trying to like get a hand on them and cut them, they just tore right out of the ground. Uh, I would say the same thing happened with barley, which was harvested a little bit late here. Is that they, the root system decomposes, it loses its grip, and then it comes out, and that's exactly what you don't want to happen. So um, it's another reason to harvest in a timely manner. And you know, like, like we talked about, I'm gonna grab one of these cobs. Um, gauging maturity or readiness for harvest can be pretty easily done by just sticking your thumbnail into it. And this is, I mean, my thumbnail just kind of goes right into it. So if we were to look at the, the milk line, this is that pretty much half milk, I would say. So that one that we had inside, the, it was already mature. You couldn't see a milk line. Um, this is a, a good indication that it's just in like the middle of the dough stage and nowhere near harvest. Um, of course you, you can, this, this testing method is destructive. Um, so, you know, you don't wanna do it on all of your plants or too often. You don't wanna do it like every day for a few weeks, um, depending on the size of your, your plot. Um, but again, it is fairly easy to just walk through your field and, and feel with your thumbnail how hard things are. Uh, beans are pretty much the same thing. And if you get good weather and you're not too wet, all of these crops can just be harvested straight, not, not on a day like today where it was really rainy, 
but harvest it straight and go into just basic air drying um, and be suitable for storage for a while. Corn on the other hand, because it lives in a husk, is almost always going to be wetter even when that corn kernel is hard. Um, so you might be harvesting it at say 20 to 25 percent moisture and you want that storage moisture to be in the mid-teens or even lower if you can. Um, and so that's why when you walk, I mean when you're driving around in corn country, there's blowers and heaters going in the fall and it's almost exclusively for corn. So all the soybean or whatever else that's in the bins or they don't they don't require the heat that corn does just because it's in a husk. Um, and when you're threshing things out and it's too wet, it's going to get smushed. When you're threshing things out and it's too hard, beans are going to split, right? Beans kind of like split in half. Um, or something like sorghum or corn would just shatter, right? And so you, you would see it just kind of like a broken piece, almost as, a, as if you ran it through a coarse mill. Um, so again, just be careful about timing. Um, when it seems super duper dry and there's like, you can't get your thumbnail to make any indentation, then be careful about, you know, maybe wait, wait for a more humid day. Um, or you can try running it through some machinery or threshing it however you, you are and seeing what happens. Um, I think monitoring your processes as you go through all these is the way to kind of like do quality control as you go. Make sure that you're not going to like do your whole field and have it be too wet. You put it into storage or split your, split your beans in half or whatever it is. Um, any questions about harvest? We can do a harvest exercise if you wanted to harvest some stuff. Yeah. Um, how do you harvest your buckwheat? That's a great question. Um, so I w I'd say cutting it down with a sickle bar is often windrowed, you know, which is not something that you necessarily want to do without some equipment. But if you cut it down, so you cut it down just to um, kill it because it's indeterminate if it's not frost killed. And then you're just picking it up by hand, bundle by bundle. I mean, the same for all this stuff unless you got some equipment that can feed it in, which is awesome if you, if you do. Um, but small, any, most small grain equipment can handle buckwheat if it's sufficiently dry. I mean, it's, it's a high biomass crop with a l small amount of seed relative to like a cereal, which is very little biomass and big, big seed. Um, so you just have to make sure it's dry enough. Nice. Yeah. Just still like trying to not like, cause I, I've been harvesting like, half an acre of buckwheat by hand huh. <laughs> with a scythe. Yeah. And so I'm d I've been trying to catch it like while the dew's still on it just so I don't get as much shattering happening. Yeah. And so I did a field cure on part of mine um, and I've been slowly bringing that in but then morning glories were like just pulling stuff down in my other smaller plot um, and really a field cure I mean the jungle just continued it wasn't really like gonna cure down but as far as like moving around a lot. I mean I've just been I've like taken everybody's sheets and like tarps and like have been you know trying to dry it out but also like not have like lose all my grain in the process yeah um, I, I honestly don't know if there's any way around that without having it be direct combined okay. I think I mean those pseudo cereals are, currently aren't really bred for yeah. you know retention on the plant or whatever so and then for thresh, I mean, it seems to be just like as it dries out, just, I mean, it's coming off like really easily. I mean, I'm just like, I don't know. I'm afraid of putting it through a combine at this point because I was like, I'll just put it like run somebody's like off their combine and just run it through as a thresher. Right. But I just feel like it would be, it would just like crush my grain at this point where I'm like, you know, trying to get it dialed in for buckwheat. They've never like used to buckwheat. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, and like, it would require adjustment, I'm sure. Yeah. So anyway, just making sure I'm not like being real silly. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, any, any machinery is going to take tweaking before you get it right, for sure. So you'd lose a lot in that process, depending on how much you have. Yeah. Um, so are you thinking about like, what are my methods for hand threshing or minimal mechanization? I mean, right now I've been doing a lot of hand threshing, just getting it out of the field. <laughs> yeah. Like moving it around, trying to like keep it dry, because it's also been you know, raining and I have it in a barn and like a bunch of different contraptions for trying to get like airflow and things like that. But, sure. um, yeah, fitted sheets work really well, it holds the grain. <laughs> but, um, that's, that's actually really good advice. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I've had really limited success using tarps and trying to keep, 
you know, dragging a tarp through the field while harvesting, and th those pseudo cereals are just kind of challenging like that, I'd say. Um, I wish I had better advice for you. Yeah. Um, why don't we walk up to the top and talk about threshing and storage stuff? So, um, when thinking about how to get your grain harvested, there are a lot of different ways to do that. So, uh, in the old days, you know, everybody had like a room dedicated just to threshing and you'd pull in on your crop and then everybody kind of got together and threshed it out. Um, usually by like beating it in one way or another, right? So, if you don't have a threshing room and you're working with like small amounts of it, or maybe you have an acre, um, I mean, let's just say you're working with small amounts, some people put, just put them in, maybe you guys know this, really simple technology. Uh, put them in bags, beat the bags, a whole bunch, and then you can kind of like dribble out the seed a little bit at a time until you get down to the, the dregs, and then it requires more like cleaning at that point. Um, and do that over and over and over until you process all of your crop. Um, one, one method that, so when I first started doing beans many years ago, I was working with this bean grower and he actually just had a, a bunch of totes, maybe two or three times his size, and he would get barefoot and just kind of like walk on his beans inside of a big tote and did a really good job. So that's uh, the threshing step. Oh, there's a harvester, let me get that out of the way. Um, these are my dirty beans that the soil came out on and I'm not about to go walking on them right now anyway, but um, it's a really effective method. It's just as time consuming as any of the other by hand ones. Um, and so that would thresh them out and then there's a lot of winnowing methods, right? So, you know, put a fan on, bucket to bucket, you're just pouring, getting all that chaff, chaff blows away, you keep the seed, right? Um, or, you know, there's the hula hoop method where you put some sort of window screen in there you just throw it up on, in the air on a windy day with a hula hoop in it, catches it, you know, eventually you can work through it. Um, those methods work fairly well, but for the small scale grower who's trying to like increase efficiency, you know, it, you can only become so efficient when you're doing it that way. So um, in my opinion, I think you need to mechanize that process. It's probably the more time consuming one of all of, I mean, maybe carrying it's like really laborious, but just the time it takes. If you're threshing beans out by hand, let's just say, um, I, mean, I mean, has anybody just sat there and done this, you know, a whole bunch where you just one by one by one, right? That's gonna take you forever. Uh, and the, so that's, that's uh, very thorough. You beat in a bag and it's not very thorough. You're probably gonna lose a lot to shatter or ones that aren't gonna get uh, threshed out. So there's a, a total lack of economy in this. Um, and so I think it's important to try to mechanize and then the extent to which you're mechanizing is up to you. So there's probably a fair amount, depending on where you are in the country, of really old equipment that's tractor drawn, PTO driven, that you can pull behind you as a little combine, as like a small scale grain producer. Um, I mean, I, I happen to have worked with a guy who had a dairy farm and he offered to give me his. Um, if I needed it at the time, I would have taken it. But if you look in the right places, you might be able to find cheap used equipment. I know for uh, some bean growers I used to work with up in New York, they bought all their equipment out of Canada where they used to do a whole lot of bean production. This is like 50 year old equipment, got it for a good price, right? So you can buy old used stuff if you want and you have a tractor and that's a, a really great way to do it. Um, if you have a walk behind, there are coming online some attachments for that that are going to be like mini combines. Um, you can also buy mini combines. You can buy plot combines that are like this wide, you know, and this tall, so they're not huge, like houses. Um, or you can buy ones that are like these sort of intermediate ones that are maybe attached to a, a walk behind and something else at the same time. Um, this is an example of just a threshing and winnowing machine that's like not necessarily very efficient but a way to mechanize it and so um, we could try running some grain through there we have a variety of grain and see what comes out the back and so this is just kind of a homemade rig it's a prototype um, so it's not necessarily uh, dialed in at this point but the idea, and 
so I because I used to work on a combine, I just kind of made this thing up, but um, I, just, I just took combine ideas and backscaled it to a threshing machine. And um, I think it would need some serious engineering to be efficient, but the idea is really simple. There's this spinning cylinder on here like this. It has a bunch of little knobs that stick out. So these are called fingers on a combine and this is for threshing out small grain and beans. If you're working with corn, it's these, these sort of like serrated bars that go across, they call rasp bars. Um, but I don't work with corn and so I just went ahead and made this. This is more geared toward legumes than to small grain. So it's like, like larger seeded stuff. Um, and then it's really simple. Once it gets beat through here, um, oh, and the, the other piece is there's a, uh, a thing that kind of matches the outer diameter on, down here, and they call it the concave, and you just adjust how close the concave is to the cylinder, and that's how you adjust like how finely it's threshing things. Um, but I mean, once it gets beat out of there, that's, that's the main step is the threshing. And then there's winnowing, which just involves a fan uh, blowing air, moving air across and blowing out the lighter stuff. And then a series of screens are what's below here. And so, um, again, this is like kind of homemade and jerry-rigged, so there's nothing that's perfect about it. But, um, you know, this is where the coarse material lands that you don't want. And theoretically, all the stuff that you do want falls through it. And you've got this fan here in the back that's going to get rid of some of it. Of course, you have to, like, reach in there pretty often and get rid of the straw. Um, but then a series of screens so you can be selective about what you want. And so this first screen is to screen out large seeded stuff if I was working on small grains if I had large seeded weeds. Um, and then I catch my small grains here on this next one. And then this one down here is just to catch all the little guys. But So that's a window screen in that one. Catches the little guys but lets really small weed seeds through. So like pigweed would maybe go through that. But of course you could, I mean, this is like a one that's intermediate between these two. You can just swap out for whatever is most appropriate. And I think this would need like some serious dialing in every time you go to harvest or per crop at least. Um, so, what, I mean, in theory on this one, you can dump the things you don't want out this side and then collect the things you want out the back over here. Um, and then because you have multiple screens, you can just put like a chute off of each one and collect it in a separate bucket or whatever kind of thing you're collecting it in. And then um, you look at it as you go and you say, okay, I got a lot of pigweed seed in this batch and just a little bit of oats. I think I'm going to chuck this at the end of the day and just keep my big oats, that kind of thing. And then you could, I mean, theoretically, you could just take these screens or, you know, take off the lid and use it as a winnower and do some cleaning, just dump it back through and repeat the process until, you know, you get everything adjusted so that what comes out the bottom is clean seed. So it, in theory, it could double as a, a thresher and winnower and a, a, you know, sort of a low end seed cleaner. Um, but so why don't we run some, w without any expectation of success, let's... Let's run some grain through here and just see what happens. So we've got um, barley, oats, beans, and sorghum. Let's do a little bit of each. We'll make like a porridge down here and just kind of see what comes out the back. Um, this is dangerous, you know, if your finger went in there. So we'll just have to be very careful. Uh, again, this is a prototype with a piece of cardboard on the front because on its first use, I realized that half of the stuff comes out this side. Um, but we can go ahead and fire it up. Are you okay with a loud engine kind of a thing? Um, and just see what happens. Could we get a volunteer to sign a waiver and then use it? Hey, there we go. Um, so these were oats or is this barley? Oats. So these oats were grown on this little plot earlier. Um, they were scythe harvested, or scythe cut, and then just harvested by hand. Um, and then I just wanted to get them out of the field, so I stuck them in this bin, and, and here they are. Let's just feed it in little by little. And we can, actually, it, it might be most useful if everybody is, so you're gonna be on that side, and then what's coming out the back is gonna be over here, you can see here, and then of course you can kinda see through the through things on, over here on this side. Um, so, let's go ahead and crank her up.
speed it in heavier if you want. As long as it takes it, you know. Sure. You can break them or cut them, whichever. Right. We're going to be here until that barrel's empty, so... gonna take all night. It does. I, th I think actually she's grabbing the um, all the straw where it's already kind of like I shaken off. Yeah, I think all, most of the seeds are in like the bottom of this thing. Let's see if she wants to dig a little deeper. I have a feeling that most of the oats have fallen off a lot of the straw. And they're on the bottom. Yeah. We could, why don't we change crops real quick? Okay. Let's come over here and get some barley. Watch yourself. There you go. This will be a lot better. I'll scoot it closer. That's, that's enough, that's enough. Yeah. We'll see how this this stuff likes to wind around the thing, so we'll just... Oh, it's so long yeah, and yeah. Cool. Um, One other thing I didn't talk about is they end up just hanging out in the, yeah. the low spot yeah. there. It is what it is. Um, Do you want to switch? Yeah, we can switch. Does anybody else? Anybody else want to give this a go? Yeah. Alright, man, so this one tugs the tugs the whole thing. So you kind of have to hold on to the stock. Because it won't go through as we can think? It, well, it doesn't like thresh it out very well, but it's okay. going to want to like wrap around the cylinder. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Man, a nice guy. Uh, that was like this. I just saw them go like this with me. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is essentially that. Yeah. Go for it. Pull it out, yeah. So this, this one's a little bit tough. I think it works really well if you have the whole stock. Oh. Yeah, that's all right. Really well if you have a what? The whole stock, something to hold on to. Take a while, huh? A bunch of them there. Did you get cut? No, no. I'm just examining it. Yeah. You want to give it a go? Okay. Um, Barley. Yeah, show's over. Good time to quit. Okay, so you guys get the idea. It can work. Needs tweaking. All right, so yeah, we can go ahead and head back. I think it's about dinner time.
talk about storage maybe a little bit? <laughs> yeah, let's talk about storage. So if, if we can harvest our crop, which maybe we can or can't, depending on how well we're doing our things. Um, but let's just assume we get our crop harvested. What are we going to do with it? So depending on your scale, I assume you're not going to need a grain bin, you know, like whatever size grain bin. Um, and so I know a lot of like, for example, bean growers that are covering maybe 20 acres. Um, and they actually just put all their beans in bags and hang them. Um, just burlap bags, cloth bags, whatever works for you. Put a fan on them and call it good. Um, so that's one method. I, and I think that's like, if your crop is relatively dry in the field when you harvest it, you probably don't got much to worry about. Um, as you can imagine, the higher the moisture content and the warmer the temperature, you know, the worse it gets for you. So if you can minimize moisture, you can't really control temperature unless you're going to put it in a fridge. If you can minimize your moisture going into harvest, you're better off, or going into storage. So people just air dry. Um, I could imagine that you could devise, without a whole lot of work, you know, some sort of barrel system where you store them in that can double as like a dryer if you have a heating element or whatever in it. Um, just trying to keep to low technology to minimize cost because the next step up, um, there's really nothing to fill that gap between like super simple and fancy grain bins. Um, whereas like for harvest and field operations, you know, there's like walk behind tractors and mini combines and stuff like that. There's not a good commercially available intermediate. So um, barrels and bags, any other ideas? It's very simple things to store. Whatever holds something that mice aren't going to get into. Um, that sort of thing. I've had a lot of mice trouble by leaving bags in the wrong places. So suspending them in the air is really helpful or just putting your bags in barrels eventually for storage. Um, that's it. Any questions or suggestions? On storage, harvest, nutrients, blah, 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 anything. Yeah. I've been doing some research on the pressure machines similar to what you built, and there seems to be the only, uh, the only thing I can find is in India or China. Right. There's one company in Great Britain that seems they may, may have a product, but there's really not much that I've found in this country. I don't know if anybody else has. Great question. Has anybody gone looking? I found something online from the uh, Mennonite community, but I can't remember. It was a long time ago, just researching, so I don't remember what it was, but it, uh, yeah, it was a foot powered. Yeah. Ah, we we have a foot powered thresher that I don't think would work very well. Nobody's actually used it here. Okay. But yeah. yeah this was like uh, pretty expensive, so I imagine it works. I saw the video. Yeah. It looked like they were. It took maybe three or four people, but they were filling the bin pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but that, I think that's. I assume it's American made. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would put a motor on that. Yeah. That's just me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't have a problem going to India or China. It's just the shipping kills you. you know, the, sure. The pressure machine's $500, but it's 1500 2000 to yeah. Just one. Yeah. If you bought a container full, then it'd be more cost, cost effective. Nobody's so, importing. I'll, I'll add to that that I think there's a lot of interest in this and community share, share sort of thing. If you wanted to share cost, you know, spread it out across people or have somebody make something for you, fabricate it. Um, and I do know for sure that there's a lot of people out there thinking about this, so some opportunity there. Yeah. All right, if there's no other questions, I think we're going to eat in like 10 minutes, maybe less, five minutes. But uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. I really appreciate it. Hopefully you learned some stuff. And uh, bon appetit. Let's eat some.